I'd like for you to, be, to begin with, considering what happened at 3 o'clock this morning, to turn to Matthew 24, 6. I'd like to begin uh, with this. I've adjusted the sermon early this morning based on our current events, which I think some of you may be aware of. And if you're not, this morning early, um, there were three countries that collaborated together as a team to strike, send missiles or strike three places in Syria uh, where there were chemical wef- uh, weapons stored. The three countries are Britain, France, and the United States. The order was given last night by President Trump, but it was executed early this morning. So would you please uh, read with me if you can turn to Matthew 24, verse 6, and it's a verse that most of us know by heart, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. So kids, if you're listening and you hear me talk about some scary things today, don't be afraid, because the Bible says you will hear about these things And the first thing that human beings would do would be to be afraid. But don't be afraid. That's the command from God. And that's what I hope we stay tracking on today. There is no fear in the presence of God. Amen? There is absolutely no fear when you're in the family of God. Amen. And so today that is the message. However, we need to be aware. Our antennas need to be up. We need to have our cell phones open and watching the news, and then we need to be saying, okay, how does that relate to the Bible? And that's one of the things that I love about my friend's preaching is that it's very relatable, it's relevant, and you will never be bored. You will not waste your time when you go to hear my friend Brian McMahon uh, speak about the book of Revelation and how it applies to our lives today. So my question to you is this, are we on the brink of World War III this morning? If there is a war that happens as a result of these airstrikes and the things that we're not, most of us in the US aren't too concerned about what Syria could do in response, but we are very much taking notice of what, the, what Russia could do in response, And so the question is, if there is going to be a war, there's one thing you can bank on, and that's the focus of today's Bible study. You can bank on the fact that there will be prisoners of war, which we call in short POWs. That happens with every war. I went back and did a little research. I won't share it all with you, but it was interesting to me to find out that uh, there is a difference for those that are in the service, between an MIA, missing in action, and a POW, prisoner of war. Missing in action are people who we just, we just wrote them off. We don't know where they are, so we have tombs of unknown soldiers, bodies that were recovered, no dog tags, no identification. So these are people who, who have been lost, and the families know that they're gone, but they don't know if they're missing in action, or if they're prisoners of war, still alive somewhere, just taken into another country. Uh, It is estimated that there were 7,000 POWs taken alive into North Korea. You will see the numbers, about 300. That's what you will see if you look it up. But then if you keep doing research, you will discover that there were thousands. Uh, The same in Vietnam. You'll see a few hundred uh, POWs, but if you do the research, you will find out that there were thousands who were just left behind. Now, the Marines, we have a Marine here, right? What's, what's one of the main themes that as a Marine you learned? No one left behind. Have you heard that phrase? Um, yeah. No one left behind. Say it with me. No one left behind. That if there is anything, if there is any hope that a military person has... It is the fact that whether dead or alive, you will not be left alone. You will not be left behind. But today, I want to ask you a question. Do you know a POW? 
a prisoner of war, someone who survived and, and is here to talk about it. Uh, in a few moments, I'm going to share with you an interview I had with a POW this week. But the biggest question I have is this. How likely is it that you will become a POW someday? Now remember, the Bible says we do not not need to be afraid of the wars and the rumors of wars. But my question to you is still this. How likely is it that you will be a POW someday? And you may say, are you kidding me? What on earth? But if we were ever... If it was ever a legitimate time to ask that question, it's today, this morning, five or six hours after the possible escalation of military action in a place that is a tinderbox. Trust me, I've lived in Lebanon, I've lived in Pakistan, uh, I have so many friends in the Middle East, it's a tinderbox, both Jewish and Muslim. It's a tinderbox, just reading with the slightest whiff of a flame to affect all of us in this world. So my prayer is today, oh God, I want to join the prayer of our two precious little sisters this morning, asking you to grow this church and and grow your body around the world. And I want to add to that prayer, oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Help us during our study of POWs today, not to be alarmed, but rather encouraged as we prepare to become prisoners of war. In your holy name, amen. So before I tell you the truth, I want to tell you some false news, which, by the way, is always false lies mixed with truths. False news wouldn't sell if it didn't have a combination of truth and false. And so as I tell you this false news today, I want you to think, okay, what is it that he's saying that's true and what's not true? And we're going to revisit it for just a moment so that you know what I'm telling you is true and what isn't true. So here it is. This morning, April 14, at 3 a.m., Syria declared war on Britain for bombing the presidential palace in Damascus, the oldest inhabited city in the world. During a raid um, that was carried out by Syrian terrorists in the British countryside at 6 a.m. today, three towns were destroyed. One documented case of a female child who was abducted, abducted. General Ali Abdullah Ayyub, Syrian Minister of Defense, is dying of a terminal skin disease caused by poison gas. His boss, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, ordered a poison gas attack last Saturday, killing 40 people in a Damascus suburb. This morning at 9 a.m., the president of Syria requested that the British Prime Minister, Theresa May, order Reverend Justin Welby, Archbishop of Canterbury, to perform the miracle. If the general, the Syrian general, is healed, Syria will halt all hostilities. This request has caused a flurry of diplomatic negotiations between the Syrian and British heads of state, complicated by the capture of a 10-year-old British child as a prisoner of war who has been forced by the Minister of Defense to clean his house and serve his wife. All right, that's the false news. What about it was true and what about it is false? Uh, This morning, April 14, at 3 a.m., Syria declared war on Britain. Is that true? No, that's not true. Not yet. May happen, but it's not true. Uh, For bombing the presidential palace. Did that happen? No. It was bombing storehouses of chemical weapons. On Damascus. Is that true? Yes. Yes. And is Damascus the oldest city in the world, inhabited, continually inhabited? Yes, Yes, it is. Now, during a raid carried out by Syrian terrorists in the British countryside at 6 a.m., did that happen? Well, I haven't checked recently, but I don't think so. I checked at 6 a.m., but I didn't check since then. Three towns were destroyed. I made that up. In one case, a female child was abducted. Is that true? It could be, but... 
no, I have no evidence for that. Now, General Ali Abdullah Ayyub, he is the Syrian Minister of Defense, so that's true. Is he dying of a terminal skin disease caused by poison gas? Not that I know of, but it could be. Not that I know of. But you're seeing now that this morning uh, at 9 a.m., the president of Syria requested the British Prime Minister, Theresa May. Is, is that really the pri British Prime Minister, Theresa May? Yes, that is true. But it requested her at 9 a.m., not true. To order Justin Welby, the Archbishop Bishop of Canterbury. Is that true? Archbishop? Yes, he is. To perform a miracle of healing? No. If the general is healed, Syria will halt us hostilities. No, I wouldn't trust anybody's word on halting hostilities. And the flurry of diplomatic negotiations. Not true. I made that up. But it was made up, and it sounds like it could be true, because of what is true. Now let me give you the unadulterated truth from the Bible about a similar story. Would you turn with me to this story, 2 Kings, it's found in 2 Kings chapter 5. And the whole story is found in verses 1 through 14. We are just going to focus on the first four verses. So this is the true story that I want to share with you about being a POW, and it's what I call the youngest POW that the Bible records. There may have been someone else, but this is the one that I know of that the Bible teaches, a prisoner of war, the youngest prisoner of war. And so this is an amazing story. Background, Syria and Israel have been at war for at least 30 years. Now, 30 years is a long time to be at war, 30 years. And it could be more. That's the conservative estimate. General Naaman, who was the Syrian minister of defense, the counterpart of the guy that's, that's here today that I referenced, General Naaman, the Syrian minister of defense, and that's true, he was the highest ranking military officer, second only to the king, was a powerful but good man who had been victorious over his enemies, the Bible says, if you're reading through that story right now. Syria had been granted by God victories, and guess what? Some of those victories were over Israel. Israel had been a very naughty family of God who needed some discipline, and God gave it through Naaman, the general of Syria, who was a good, upright man and had been used by the Holy Spirit to punish God's very own people. Is that an amazing truth? This lays the foundation for the smallest POW, the little prisoner of war that we're going to talk about. Maybe you girls already know who I'm talking about. The youngest prisoner of war found in the Bible. Well, this general had a problem. As powerful and as good as he was, and as blessed as he was by God to be victorious, he was wasting away with a dread disease called leprosy. Now, leprosy is a disease, there you go, that's a picture of someone who has leprosy. Leprosy is alive and well, particularly in Africa, Asia, India, where I've spent a lot of time in Pakistan. I, I can't tell you the numbers of people when I get off the train in Pakistan and India who come to me with little, little pails, little buckets, their hands completely eaten away, and they're resting the pail here, and they're, they're, they have one or two coins in their buckets, and they're sloshing their buckets around, and the clear request is for something to eat, and so you put something in the bucket. And you haven't lived until you've seen a person whose nose has been totally eaten away by leprosy, called Hansen's disease. Uh, it, it sometimes takes four years, sometimes 40 years for it to reach its course. It's a slow-moving death machine. And at the time, of course, we understand it no, now. We understand that uh, our little girl, who was ripped away from her parents, Possibly her parents killed. P 
possibly her little home was destroyed by fire, grabbed by somebody, put on a camel or a horse, brought into a foreign country where she did not know the language, had to learn a language, had to mourn the loss of her mama and daddy and her brothers and sisters, and had to realize that she was never going back. I can tell you as a, a longtime career missionary, if we had been sent to Pakistan and told, you're going to stay here until you die, that's the deal, we'd have never gone. We were just not that tough. The deal was every three years, you can come home and visit grandma and grandpa and relatives. That was the deal, and that was long enough. That felt like an eternity. But to know that you were going somewhere where you did not know anybody, ripped away from your family, had to learn a new language, and knew there was no prospect of coming home is almost too much to bear. And yet this little girl, we find her, the youngest POW in the Bible, uh, coming to this new family. And the worst part of the experience was this, because she knew about leprosy. Mo in her country, the children of Israel, they, they had laws by then. Leviticus had been written. They knew that people with leprosy had to be separated out from the rest of the crowd, or there was a possibility that the infection would, would come to them. This little girl knew that, and here she was brought into the home of a man whose body was being eaten away by leprosy. She had to wash his dishes. She had to, to clean his clothes. She had to be around the droplets from his nose and mouth, which transmit uh, leprosy. And she had to be the one to take care of everything to prepare the food and do the cleanup. This little girl, by the name leprosy mycobacterium leprae, shouldn't come as a shock to you, this little girl did her job. Now what we've discovered from the Bible story, as you have been reading it while I've been talking, is that this little girl believed in miracles. And here's where it gets tough. Here's where it gets personal. Because when I go through tough times, I typically pray for a miracle for myself. Right now, I'm praying with my brothers and sisters who are in this shelter for just another couple weeks to find another shelter. I, I do not like it to think that they have to walk around all night uh, in the rain and the muck. And even if the weather gets better, how many of you have gone on a two-year camp out? with no place to take a shower. Give me a break. This is not an easy life. And I want for like everything, and I am praying like everything for a miracle for my friends. But it's interesting that this little girl prayed no prayer for herself. With all of the stuff that she was embracing, and Scholars think, it's, the Bible makes it clear she was a little girl, so she wasn't a teenager, maybe eight or ten, maybe a junior, primary age group, little girl. And, and so she didn't pray the prayer that said, please help me get, find my way back home. Please, uh, please help me grow up and in a few years be able to escape, maybe when I'm 20. Um, Please keep me from getting leprosy. That would be my prayer, short term. Those were all prayers she could have prayed. But instead, she prayed this prayer found actually in 20 words. It was a prayer-backed declaration. And the statement that she makes in 20 words actually uh, received the notice of two heads of state, one prophet, and one minister of defense, among others. These 20 words, here it is. If only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. Those 20 words caused um, Naaman's wife, the boss, to take notice. I can only imagine her talking to her husband that night. Do you know what our maid said? And then she repeated it. 
there's a prophet in Samaria and he would heal you if you could only get there? And Naaman said, really? And the next day he goes to the king of Syria and says, king, there is a prophet in Samaria who would heal me if I could only get there. And the king does what kings do, heads of state. Oh, well, I need to write a letter to the other head of state. So he does to the king of Israel. And the king of Israel receives this letter saying, please heal. Basically says to the king of state, heal, heal my guy. We're at war, but don't worry about that. <laughs> it's a little thing. In fact, I heard this news from somebody that we took as a POW, but that's just a little thing. Heal my guy, and I'll give you this money, and maybe we can adjust our hostility, our war situation for the time being. And of course, the king of Israel gets this, and he looks at it, and he thinks it's a trick. He's setting me up for failure. I can't heal his guy. And somehow the word from the palace gets out, to Elisha, the prophet, and Elisha hears about it, and Elisha sends a message and says, well, if you can't, I can, and I will. And that's treasonous, by the way, to heal the minister of defense from your enemy country that has been ordering these attacks on you. That's craziness. It makes absolutely no sense. But Elisha was a kind of person that was willing to follow the Holy Spirit. And so... We know that General Naaman was sent there. Elisha gave him some instructions. At first, found it difficult to dip himself in the Jordan seven times, but he did, and he was healed. And now, for us, how does this apply? A few days ago, I had an interview with a POW from Vietnam. When I asked him, what was the first fact that you knew after you had been taken captive? He said, I knew I was going to be killed either today or tomorrow. Just a matter of time. I knew that my life was over. That's what I knew. What did you feel? I felt like nobody would know where I was, that I would die alone, and that none of my family or friends would find me. And that made me feel terrible, so isolated. What did you experience? I experienced extreme humiliation because when the enemy agent who was hurting me and interviewing me told me lies, I could tell they were lies, and that didn't bother me at all because I knew they were lies. But when he told me the truth, that really hurt, especially when the truth was about myself. Eventually, due to the humiliation, the scorn, the pain, the isolation, my friend, uh, my friend signed, some, signed some things that he didn't believe, but just to somehow get out from under, he couldn't take it any longer. And immediately when he signed those, the enemy said, you're a disloyal blankety-blank of the United States military. You have just, you, you have no business. You say you're military, what are you? You've just signed this document. You don't belong. You're worth nothing. And he said that was true. And that hurt the worst. My friends, you may think this is just a story about a little girl, a Vietnam vet, but I want to tell you there's much more to it than that. Today, if you read the book of Revelation, if you go to the seminar, you will discover last night we saw a picture, a word picture of Satan being held in chains, Revelation 20, 1 through 3. Satan bound at the beginning of the millennium. But before he's bound, he's loose. He's like a roaring lion. And he is the slave master of this world. And if you belong to Satan's world today, you're a POW. You belong to his world, he's holding you hostage. He is uh, not going to let you free. He is going to give you, t tell you lies, and then he's going to tell the truth about yourself that's so true that it just, just like my friend, 
it sends you down into the dumps because you know you're, it's right. He's right. I am disloyal. I am not to be trusted. I am not worth anything. That's what the evil one does. He turns on you in a moment. And if you're his POW today, that's what he's doing to you. E even if you are a Christian living in the kingdom of heaven, part of you is still a POW. And my question for us today, each one of us, is this, that as POWs, will we be praying to be released from this terrible condition or will we be able to accept whatever it is that God has given to us and pray for our enemy who is dying of leprosy and whom we should say, good riddance, die quick and have as much pain as possible. You have inflicted pain on others. And instead of that, like this little girl, the little POW, she prayed saying, I know there is a prophet in my country. There is a prophet in my church. There are all kinds of people in my church that can lay hands upon you and heal you. And if only you could get there, you'd be healed. Today, that's the training God wants to give us. You may be a real life POW someday. I may be. I came close to it a couple times in the mission field in the Philippines by almost taken captive by rebels, just that close. But I have never experienced it yet. But far beyond that, my brothers and sisters, we live in a war zone. And there is a God in heaven who's promised Daniel and Revelation, he's promised there will be a little stone cut out without hands that will come and rule this world. But right now, we are here in the devil's world, and he is ruling the darkness of this world, and we live in this place. We are not yet there where our address is. We are here, and some of us have no addresses. But today, make no mistake, we are POWs, prisoners of war. Even in the best of times, we are still prisoners of war. And my question for you is, would you be like this little girl, the littlest POW that I know of in the Bible? Would you be like her and pray for your enemy and ask that your enemy find healing? And by the way, the word for healing in Greek and salvation is the same. Soteria. Find salvation, find healing. Would you pray? Would you find somebody who may be your worst enemy today, who you think is the one who least understands you and has been mean to you, and be able to say, amen, I have someone coming up for baptism already. Oh, praise the Lord. Would you be willing, like a little child, to pray?